right back. Hi, this is Mark Oberholzer. This is Mark Oberholzer. The nation's leading weekly live talk meeting with Dr. Tandy Color Computer. Radio Shack Storyline Manager's Rock Tag Sale is on now. We've slashed prices 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. Save on famous Radio Shack Hi Fi, car stereo, radios, toys, TV games, calculators, walkie talkies, and CB radios. Look for the big red tag. Save like never before on these and literally hundreds of red tag specials. Hurry into Radio Shack today. Hey guys. All right, we are back. We are back, and um, we have with us now Mr. Bruce Moore, the author of Forest of Doom, our work in progress Forest of Doom, author of many other great titles available on T&D software at your local uh, Cocoa retailer near you. <laughs> and and so on your journey of, of working on your project that's 30-some-odd years in the making, which was original. Oh, hold on, what's Curtis holding up here? Let's zoom in on Curtis here for a second. What do you got here? We got a T and D software right there. Color computer cassette number fifty, volume fifty. Very. Yeah, you'd cool. have to let me know which ones he specifically did because I've got about a half a dozen or a dozen of them. So neat. Might need to get those autographed too. So when that happens, <laughs> um, <laughs> very cool. So you're working on Forest Doom right now, which you're doing mostly in a normal uh, color basic, which is built into the ROM. Um, but then you've also started to t uh, dip your toes into the water that is Basic 09 on the OS 9 operating system, right? Oh, and you've even got the manual. Very cool. So uh, I have that video, and now I just got to find it real quick. So hold on one second. You, you prepared a, a, a small video for us. And let me switch over where we can see it, where we can show you a little demo of doing Basic 09 here for one second. So can you guys see my screen? Yeah, okay. my first yep. attempt, attempt at getting, getting into the 9 on So we've got a Nitrous 9 hard drive, and we've got a Nitrous 9 boot disk in our floppy. You can okay. see that. I'm hearing a little bit of echo if anybody's got their speakers on or not. It's real quiet. Okay, so you're using v VED as what a, a text editor, right? Okay, you just mentioned that you're switching windows right now. Okay, but I'm not using this editor. I'm going to flip back to the other one. I'm flipping through these other windows. Okay, okay here we are. Now, you just flip back, back to your editor, you, met, you said. Make sure I go procedure. Otherwise, I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Print. Hello. Save there. I have to go use dollar sign to get to the shell and look there. And there is test VO9 in the bottom left hand corner. So now we go load. Now you're, gonna, you're mentioning that you're going to load in your test basic 09 file. Ready. Run. Hello world. Could I have done this? Apparently not. <laughs> it says, I, I don't know, I don't care at this point. That's cool, though. All right, so let me switch back where we can all uh, see what we're talking about again. But um, very cool. So you um, booted up OS 9 on VCC, of all emulators, 
uh, you had an OS 9 boot disk on a floppy that got you to a hard drive. You ran VED, which was a text editor. You typed in a very small program, loaded that into Basic 09, and ran it. So just kind of showing that things can be done in Basic 09. And um, from what Curtis has told me, it's faster for a variety of reasons. Yes. And um, cool stuff. So uh, anything else you'd like to share with us on your uh, experiences with Basic 09 right now? I mean, not a whole lot. I'm, uh, I'm fighting through the uh, sort of the emulators. So I've switched over to MAME mm -hmm. on my Mac, and I've got that reasonably working now. And and then it, there's these tiny little syntax things. So uh, you know, I'm looking at a piece of code, wondering why is this not running? And I, you know, and then it's like then I see, well, when I'm doing this type command, you don't use curly braces. You got to use square ones. Oh. I, Okay, fine. You know, so a whole bunch of silly little things like that because I'm, okay. I'm used to basic syntax. Otherwise, um, so so far fun. It's uh, being the basic 09 is a structured language. There's a lot more power and flexibility. Self-documenting. I expect that once I just you know get used to the new syntax and the you know the key combinations with Mame that uh, I can probably put something together, you know, a lot faster than, certainly a lot faster than if I started trying to write something in assembly right now. Um, and, yeah, and uh, my brother gave me a great idea for a, a spin-off of Forest of Doom, which I thought I would, uh, as my first little foray into Basic 09, I thought I'd try something like that. So, okay, a, cool. a sequel, as it were. Very cool. Yeah, yes. and Curtis has been a lot of help. Curtis and Curtis has been a lot of help on the basic 09 and then David Ladd's been helping me get the whole main thing figured out and and why my image from Bill Noble wasn't booting turned out I was um, at, I was pointing to the Coco 3 ROM that the 6809 ROM not the 6 what's the other one 6309 6309 yeah yeah well, as soon as we sorted that out then everything worked worked again so but you know Need, need the expertise of the other people in the community to point me in the right direction. Very cool. And we have you, plenty of that. Did you have any questions uh, based on that video that you wanted to ask while we're on the on the air so that other people can learn at the same time? Like like you had a couple questions, I think, in, in, during your video even. Oh. Um, well, I, I, hmm, let me see here. At the end, I was just wondering whether I could say run and the file name. And Okay. Uh, no. I, I can explain that. There's there's a local <laughs> directory for your procedures in Basic 09 because you can have multiple C procedures in your loaded in RAM. So okay. when you're doing Duran stuff, it's showing your RAM copies that are in Basic 09 itself. Um, so you can run a certain procedure. You have a procedure named test. You have another one called test 2 and another one called test 3. So you do run test 2, test 3. Uh, it won't load it from disk because that is meant to only run within your current Basic 09 workspace. So you can, and you can have multiple procedures in one file. If you went to your VD editor and you made procedure test, procedure test two, procedure demo or whatever, if you load them up into Basic 9, you'll suddenly see all three of them pop up, and then you can run them individually from there. Right. And so now, so if I call uh, from a Basic 09 program, I call a procedure which isn't currently in RAM. My understanding is it's going to go looking for it on a disk. Is that is that right? Um, y if it's packed, yes. If like if okay. you've packed it down, semi-compiled it, if if you're okay. trying to run it just from raw source code like you're doing right now, on the demo, then no, it won't go run and get it. It'll try to get it within Basic Nine's workspace first. If it can't find it, then it'll go into your commands directory and try to get a packed one. It doesn't have to be a Basic Nine program. You can call assembly language programs, C programs, Pascal programs, Fortran, COBOL, whatever you want. Yeah, that's another thing I find. Uh, I think would be really cool because um, you know with RS Basic, like, I would occasionally call small little a machine language code bits and it looks like it'll be even easier under basic 09 to do that very same thing so i'm looking forward to fiddling with that too yeah yeah you can call like graphic display viewers you can call them the play command i did that plays WAV files and all kinds mm. of things so yeah mm. yeah and did i hear you say something about um ed snyder's drivers maybe ending up in os9 well we were talking about it for doing the streaming and it's definitely capable of doing it. I mean, you'll basically cut multitasking out during the duration of it. But yeah, there's no reason you couldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that creates a lot of possibilities for uh, for game development, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's cool. It. 
That's yeah. a cool. So you're working on a uh, a project right now that's using traditional basic ROM based basic, and so you're already thinking about a follow up, a sequel that might run in basic 09. So that's kind of cool. Um, it's nice to yeah. see people testing these new platforms and 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 you know taking it. I, I can't. I can't imagine what was the next to what you're doing now. What's the most recent project that was written in basic O9? I'm sure there might be some people at home who are maybe doing something, but as far as what the community knows about and might be an actual product that we're going to be able to get our hands on sometime. It's kind of cool that there's going to be a new project and a new game or whatever written in basic O9 in 2017, you know, kind of cool. Cool. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for blazing the trail there, Bruce. Sure, it's fun. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it, right? Yeah. Uh, I know Bill and I, we use Basic 9 for our work development because we were basically uh, a rapid application development rad programming. You had to write a program as quick as possible, not run it as fast as possible, but write it as quick as possible. And Basic 9 was so much faster than doing it in C or assembly. So yeah. we wrote everything for literally 15 years using Basic 9. Very, very yeah, cool. Yeah, that's my hope too. Like, if I, you know, I don't want to spend the next three years trying to write another game for the Coco. Like, I'd like to get it out, get it done, and get it out. And and I'm not doing graphic intensive stuff, so the speed is not as important. Okay, Grant Leedy is asking the question: Is Basic 09 slash Nitrous 09 being updated? And 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 then it's also saying: How is Basic 09 better than RS Basic? I will let Bruce answer the second one because he's kind of learning that as he, as he goes, and I'm a little bit biased. Um, as far as the first one, yes, I mean David and has been you know helping fix some bugs. We're actually working on trying to get some six three zero nine optimizations into OS nine or Nitrous nine level one for the six eight zero nine because there's some and six three zero nine because there's some spots there that you know weren't updated that should be like you know high speed TFM scrolling and clear screens and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's still being actively worked on. I mean, you know, drive wire and stuff. If we get this new SDC streaming driver, that'll be an up another update. We want to get Nick and, and John's uh, high-res joystick interface to replace the high-res joystick adapter so you don't need the hardware and still get the full resolution. That should be doable as a driver, too. I mean, Bill and I have talked about that. I mean, I'm just waiting to actually have time to actually turn my Coco back on again. That won't be for another month. But, yeah, no, it's still being actively updated. And if Bruce, if you want to say what, like sure. you know, basic obviously very well from doing your game, and now that you're working with Basic Nine, you're kind of seeing through in the manual what kind of stuff. How would yeah. you explain that it's better than the regular? Well, um, so my first foray into programming was with Radio Shack Basic. So procedural language follows line by line with line numbers and all that. When I kind of got out of that, and I was at university and studied Pascal and various other languages. Structured languages, no line numbers. They would call little bits of reusable code here and there. Um, way more flexible. Um, not having and it's getting getting rid of the line numbers, um, reason code, all that kind of stuff is just basically. If you want to know the difference, look you know look up the difference between procedural and structural languages. Google that. Uh, that'll explain it to you pretty much. Um, it's. It looks far more like a modern language. It's not that different than JavaScript that you would write in a modern web browser. That's that's part of why I'm I'm thinking. Yeah, Basic 09 that'll that'll get me back in the the, the thinking of of that kind of scripting. So uh, so yeah, and then Basic 09 um, semi compiles. Uh, so it's not entirely compiled like a, like assembly language, but um, it's not entirely interpretive like the RS Basic. So so it'll run faster, and you can access all the cool stuff OS nine uh, can do with the different yep. windowing and all. That. So I know it sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great great way to uh, break into OS nine development and a uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, I know one of my hurdle. favorite parts of it, uh, like uh, to get into a specific example, would be the type structures, which you know regular basic doesn't have whatsoever. Yeah. Um, and that's really powerful when you're dealing with disk files and and just keeping track of what the heck you're doing. Just internally in memory too. So, and I noticed your one little uh, demo uh, screen you put up on Facebook. You were actually using a type dec declaration to set up your structure for your monsters and stuff for your games. So. Yeah, yeah. The very first thing I went to when I saw the type in there, that oh, I just like okay, that's awesome. I'm going straight to it. I'll see if I can make it work. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. In the live chat, Norlander is asking, how much more difficult is Basic 09 under Nitrous 9 than regular OS 9? Is it more difficult? Is it you run exactly it the same, same way? It's exactly the same. 
loads there's, the same, there's, there's runs no the same? Except it runs faster. Okay. Okay. So the I mean, there is. I did optimize a little bit of Base Go Nine back in the day, and I think that's part of the current distribution. So I sped up some of the math routines and stuff, so it'll run a little bit faster on certain integer math and some you know integer divide and integer multiply for 16-bit numbers and stuff than the original did because I'm using the 629 instructions to do so. But as far as the, but, the language as itself, as it's, as identical. As well. it's identical. Okay. okay. Cool. And Grant Leedy is asking, what's a good book to learn Basic 09? Well, the Basic 09 manual itself is actually, the Level 2 manual is quite good. The Level 1 manual wasn't as good, <laughs> to okay. be honest. Uh, and then there's the Basic 09 tour guide by, um, not, not okay. uh, is it Dale? Dale? No, I think, uh, who uh, did? Well, I, yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking at here now. Basic 09 tour guide, this is Dale, Dale L. Puckett Microware. I've got it on my iPad here. Oh, is it Dale? I thought it was Peter Dibble. Maybe I'm remembering that wrong. But if you got the book there, yeah. Well, this is yeah. one, and there's, yeah, yeah, I think that's the basic, yeah, that's the basic 09 one. Yeah, it's Chef of Black Pepper. And are those, are those all available on the Color Computer Archive, or a handful of them anyways? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Look on the Color Computer Archive, which, by the way, is available on one of our sponsors, uh, amacoconut.com, for all your Color Computer Link needs. <laughs> you can get to the Color Computer Archive. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing. Do we have more to talk about, or can we take a quick break and um, move on to another segment? I don't we know. Does anybody we else on the call that's active uh, have any questions about BaseCon before we hit the next segment? Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to go on and look at a few things that are in the Facebook group this week. So we'll be right back after these messages. And now, these messages. On screen. Greetings, YouTubers. Atari Leaf here, and you're listening to Coco Talk. Stro here, and when you're done with Coco Talk, if you gotta have more cowbell, then head on over to my YouTube channel for your share of gameplay goodness. There you will find over 1,300 family-friendly gameplay videos. Everything from the old school to the next gen, and over 200 color computer gameplay videos, as well as interviews and replays of Coco Talk. So if you need your share of gameplay goodness, then check out the original gamer Stevie Stro on YouTube at youtubecom ogst be strong. Well, there we go. So, a little plug for gameplay goodness on YouTube. If you got to have more cowbell and you need some more games to watch, check out my YouTube channel. So, what was going on this week in Facebook? Well, here we have Simon Jonasson, the madman, as we all know and love. And he continues to work on these 3D rotating demos and continues to optimize them and just continues to throw more cowbell at the. Uh, at the graphics level of detail and the smoothness and things like that. So it's very cool looking. Um, what was this thing here called? The Tesseract, when you've got a cube within a cube and it's rotating 360 degrees. Um, so that's his latest posting that he's put in the mm -hmm. Facebook group. It looks very, very cool. Um, of course, we at the we, at the beginning of the show, we talked about how Nick Marentes um, released to the public his Pac-Man version 1.1 update with... Um, darker colors of blue on the maze and uh, some of the optimizations of the speed and the uh, intermissions running a little bit faster here is um now what's what's bart's deal he's in the netherlands right so bart and he's basically his claim to fame right now he's he's got the largest trs80 collection in in europe i think is what he's saying and so he's always showing something that he's picking up and adding to his collection here so it looks like he's got is this a model three that he picked up Okay, is that a three model, three? Four. model three or uh, four? Well, uh, it looks like it's missing a couple keys down there towards the bottom. I would bottom. guess a four because it's kind of white, isn't it? Because the yeah. three's gray, battleship gray. Right, right, right. So mm -hmm. um, low serial number, or 4177 is the serial number there. So yeah, that's a kind of a cool collection there. And that's kind of like what Ron's been doing too. Ron Delvo has been posting a lot of pictures of everything here too. So um, here we got a, uh, Steve Bjork had mentioned something too, uh, where he was asking some questions on uh, how to get up and running quickly with assembly development. Here's a picture of some CRTs running. Uh, oh, here's here we go. Here we have uh, a Commodore next to a Coco next to an Apple, and we talk about this whole community thing right here. Bill Smith posted this picture here. Um, 
Find a CRT. <laughs> I don't even remember what the question was. What was the original question? From Hugo. Okay. Okay. Hugo is asking the, the Sega phaser light gun thing. So that discussion has come up now too, right? So um, if you... Yeah. Uh, it kind of explained exactly why it doesn't work on current flat screen LCD TVs. Okay. That whole discussion. So okay. that's what brought it up. Yeah, light guns were a cool thing, but because of the timing, they had to be off of the CRT. Because and this was discussed in the Coco Crew podcast, one of the early, early episodes. Basically, a CRT is faster; it's a faster refresh rate than a um, than an LCD mm. panel is, because uh, the beams are right. You're writing to the screen; you're directly writing to the screen, whereas a panel has to receive all of the visual data, process that, and then display it. And there's a, a millisecond difference to where you just you're behind the eight ball on trying to capture some of that light gun data. Um, very cool stuff. Here's some pictures of Ron Klein running mm -hmm. um, Pac-Man 1.1 on his uh, Cocoa Pie. Ron says he's going to probably be available next week, so I've been holding off showing the Retro Pie uh, color computer setup because I really want Ron to help uh, talk about that. So here's him showing off Nick Marentis' latest Pac-Man on uh, Mame on uh, Raspberry Pi. Very cool stuff. There's me plugging Coco Talk. Uh, somebody asked this question. I think you asked the question too, Bruce, because this guy is saying, hey, I've upgraded to 512K. I've got some leftover RAM. Does anybody need it? Are, is old Coco 3 RAM usable on anything? Yes. The okay. uh, the two chip, the later Coco 2s use the two chip upgrade using 4464 chips instead of 84164s. Okay. Those are the exact same chips that are in the 128K machines. So you have enough RAM there to upgrade two Coco 2s late models to 64K. Okay. Nice. Okay. So there is a use for it. Uh, Nick Marentis is mentioning that Popstar Pilot is still available, so he's got a link to his blog there. Very cool stuff. Great game. Uh, oh, Ron Delvo, maybe next week you can show us your dragon, Ron. So Ron's got pictures sure. of his Tano dragon that he's taken out of the box and showed up here. That guy's got more stuff than, um, <laughs> than uh, it should be legal for any one person to have. Here's a picture of Bruce Moore showing off some of his Basic 09. It says right here, Basic 09 is happening. And here's some of his code right here. Read monsters. There's that huh? type statement at the top. Man, makes it makes it so much easier to code stuff. You can read it. Yeah. Like, show me the strength of the monster. I can type monster dot strength, and there it is. You know. Oh, wow. Right. So yeah, that's uh, so even having variable names that are not two letters, that in itself is yeah, exactly. <laughs> is better than uh, MS for monster strength, right? So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or multiple the sclerosis. The is, is just awesome. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's so cool. And just other variable types, like you mentioned, he's or you can see there, he's got like a boolean as well as some integers as well as some strings. Yeah. So yeah, you've got a lot of things you can play with. But two but, letters is all you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two letters is all you. Who needs more than that? Yeah. Who? Who yeah, never need like more than sixty? <laughs> just like six forty k. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. Here's Ron Delvos posting about the Coco SDC code and, and posting us some fly. This was interesting, and I, I didn't even want to comment on this because I just figured I'm not going to be that guy. But this guy posted a Coco 2 for sale. He wanted something like $124 starting price on, and there was no even accessories. So for those of us who have been watching eBay for a while, you kind of know that Coco 2s are in about the $60 to $70 price range is what they sell for. So his starting price seemed a little high. But I figured I would reserve judgment and reserve comment. But that didn't stop um, Carlos Camacho <laughs> from saying, dude, what's up with that price? I think he price? has dropped the price since then. Yeah. Because he yeah. didn't really know what. what yeah. For, so. And I just remember the same thing. When I first started looking for Cocos on eBay, um, I didn't know what to expect. The first Coco 2 I bought, I, I think I spent $100. But it was a Coco 2, 64K. It was modded with composite output. It came with a flat panel LCD television. It came with a cassette recorder and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and that was $100. But there was another guy who was selling just a Coco 2 for $96. And it was only a 16K Coco 2. And, and I compared that to everything else that was being sold there. And I even messaged the guy. I go, you know, you're, I think your asking price is a little high since it's not even 64K. But that guy was hell bent on wanting 100 bucks for a 16K Coco 2. I doubt he ever sold it. Um, there, there has to be kind of a, a fine line from, uh, you know, what people are willing to pay. The Coco 3s really seem to go up in price. They seem to start yeah. off uh, offering price of 100 to 150 and they end up selling sometimes up in the 300s. 
which is, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit sought after because they're less common, it seems. Yeah. But $124 Coco 2 is a little bit high, I think. Unless it came with some other stuff. Yeah, yeah. If, it was, if it was a bundle, that'd be different. Now, Hugo DeFort's been posting some pictures of some demos he's working on where he's coming up with plasma displays and working with color and dithering and things like that. So that's been kind of interesting to see some of his posts and some of his demos and stuff like that. Ed Snyder posted the fact that he's going to work on a 16-bit super DAC to not only get stereo output, but also at 44 kilohertz, which is basically CD quality. So when you're talking about 16-bit stereo at 44 kilohertz, but it has to be run on a Coco uh, 3 double speed, we're basically getting CD quality output from this card he's designing. And he mentioned something like, well, if you're gonna if you're gonna overdo it, you know why you know why not overdo it all the way? <laughs> and then I basically said to him that I'm like, well, dude, you just need to put this on a Coco SDC and throw in a couple of sound chips while you're at it too, because then we wouldn't even need a, a multi pack. If you had the Coco SDC and 16 bit DAX and a in a in a sound chip, boom, you're good, you're golden. Um, and I think it's all possible in the realm of technology, but that's a little over my head when you know some of that stuff has to take place. So, yeah, lots going. A lot of posting for Tandy Assembly. We're gonna, we're gonna after the next commercial break. We're gonna show the Tandy Assembly website and some of the changes and additions there. Hair Mark McDougal is teasing at something, which I believe he's teasing at. Um, he might be doing something with asteroids. But who else is supposed to be working click, on an click, asteroid? Click on the comments because he's got an updated photo. Okay, he's well. got an updated mm -hmm. photo on the comments. Okay. So uh, he's posting his website. Okay. So here's an updated photo. Um, so it's looking like a port of asteroids is probably in the making on a Coco 3. And this transcode. Is transcode. A transcode, meaning the original source code is being done. Um, mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, and since Simon's been doing a lot of this vector art, this is kind of cool that, um, that that's happening. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of cool stuff. So we're going we're gonna to talk about um, Tandy Assembly next. Here's somebody posting a keyboard with four function keys. A Coco HDL 1 57. keyboard. Yeah, and I think Michael Brandt was mentioning this one time too when somebody, ma somebody made a comment like, well, if you're talking about an F1 key, it's got to be a Coco 3. And Michael Brandt chimed in and says, well, I've got a Coco 1 with a F1, F2, F3, and F4. So, um, <laughs> yeah, very, it's a nice-looking keyboard. Yeah, there, there was multiple third-party keyboards. The Mark Data Products was basically the black one with just a standard Coco key layout, the standard 53 keys. Um, I can't remember the name of the company off the top of my head, but they made two, and they made a premium one and a professional one. One of them had four function keys kind of scattered all over the place, and then they made mm. one that kind of lined up the keys better to match the Coco 1-2 layout. Uh, another one, Keytronics, made one with just a single programmable key they labeled PF. And then the HAL57, which is when you showed there, had the four on the bottom, which I think was a better layout. And if I remember correctly, one of them actually clicks and locks in, so you could program it to be like a caps lock. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, another question here. My cat wants to come in. The Coco Cat's joining Coco Talk. Um, so somebody was asking a question here, Jim Port, about what font is closest to the original font that appeared on the color computer uh, cartridges and it looks like somebody came in and said that the font now is called micro extended and there was one somebody suggested one that's called micro grandma now there's another one called micro extended and here's kind of a screenshot of some of the fonts of the original versus some reproductions and so i guess if you wanted to do a modern color computer um, cartridge and you wanted to try to capture that font style that might be one right now. So that's been an interesting little um, discussion that's been going on there. And and it's really neat that when somebody has a question like this, people chime in. Now, granted, yes, the same level of communication and activity takes place on the mailing list, but it's not as visual. So when you're talking about a font and you want to see the font and, and you can actually look at the picture real time and not have to open up a link and go to another website where that, where that lives, um, this is where I think the power of Facebook is very helpful when it comes to um, having the community kind of collaborate here. And this was a, a really good example of that. Uh, just coming together. Uh, really cool. Carlos Camacho showing some other computer system here, the NEC 6001, which also uses the same Motorola VDG chip that DeCoco does and, and what they're doing with it. 
pretty cool stuff. So yeah, a little peek into the Facebook group. And so if you're not already a member of that and you don't, you're not one of these people that has to wear a tinfoil hat and you're worried about, you know, um, all that kind of privacy stuff and you're willing to join social media, I would definitely suggest you might want to check out the TRS-80 Color Computer Group on Facebook. Lots of good stuff going on there. Anybody else got anything they want to chime in about and what's been going on in Facebook this week? Can't think of anything off the top of my head. Uh, no. Nope. Lots of good stuff. Mm -hmm. Always good stuff. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back and we're going to see what's the latest, greatest thing going on with Tandy Assembly. And now they were from our sponsors. Hi, this is Randy Kindig of the Foppy Days Podcast. I just love me some cocoa, and nobody covers it better than Steve Strobridge. You're listening to Coco Talk. We're traveling to a dimension both of sound and ideas. We're at a place where the mind can comprehend and devise a solar radio, a wireless transmitter, measure time and light. 65 electronic projects brought to reality with this science fair kit. Astonishing, perhaps, but you can find it for Christmas for $17.95 in a place that's known as Radio Shack. Radios, stereos, recorders, everything in sound. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's me. It's Original Gamer Stevie Stro. You know, gameplay goodness. To get your very own Gameplay Goodness DVDs featuring color computer games played by the original gamer Stevie Stroh, visit 8bit256.com and grab yourself a Coco Gaming DVD today. That's 8bit256.com for all of your Gameplay Goodness needs. Fletcher, I don't need that report tomorrow. Great, JT. I need it tonight. But, JT... Fletcher saved $300 on her office away from the office. Radio Shack's revolutionary Model 100 computer. It's a word processor, phone directory, and dialer. It even communicates with the office computer. Fletcher, how's that report? Fletcher. Radio Shack's Model 100. Save $300 and put it to work. You'll go far, Fletcher. <laughs> You'll go far. From Radio Shack, the TRS-80 Model 3. And at $200 off, it's a great value. Select from Radio Shack's huge program library to aid your children's education, plan your personal and household budgets, or to entertain with fast action games. You can even learn to write programs. The TRS-80 Model 3, on sale for $7.99. Only at Radio Shack and Radio Shack Computer Centers. The computer experts. Between 1977 and 1994, Tandy and Radio Shack produced a wide array of prolific personal and business computers. Chances are you've used one. And now there's a new event designed to celebrate all of these computers in one place. Introducing Tandy Assembly. Come see your favorite computers, or maybe some that you missed. October 7th and 8th. In Ohio's first capital city, Chillicothe. See presentations by TRS-80 creator Don French. Creator of Dog Star Adventure, Lance Miklas. And Scott Adams of Adventure International. For details, visit our webpage at www.tandyassembly.com. Some assembly is required. That was the multi-talented Myros production right there. That Mike Rowan, that man can make some stuff, can he? Commercials, <laughs> videos, you name it, he can do it. Um, great segue, great lead into the Tandy Assembly website right now. And here's one of the newest developments. Again, talking about um, being in the retro hobby, but using modern technology. 
How about the convenience of being able to pre-register and prepay online using PayPal and not having to wait in line to be logged in on a color computer three, <laughs> like we have at Coco Fest. So um, that's convenient. You know, some of the modern conveniences are not a sin. You know, <laughs> so um, here we go. So in, def in defense of the Coco Fest one, they were having a problem with the Dynacalc. Something went wrong with the database. I mean, it normally works smooth. Must have got all the updates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure you know, what happened there, but they've used that program for 20 years, and well, you know, every, every like that. The, you know, the, every time you plug in the Coco, it's got to download all the latest updates off the internet, so that does take some time. Otherwise, yeah. <laughs> it blue screens. <laughs> yeah, it, it is convenient to be able to um, pay online and register. So here's the latest look at the Tandy Assembly website. So that's a new feature right now, right? So they're still looking if somebody wants to be a speaker. If you would like to give a presentation at Tandy Assembly, they're still calling for that. You can still get your early bird registration discount right now uh, through August 31st if you wanted to be an exhibitor. So that is kind of cool. Uh, lots of Tandy artwork here. You can see the different models here. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of these on display when, when we get there in October. Here's the venue, right? So this is the Christopher Conference Center in Chillicothe, Ohio. What's going to be happening here? Exhibits, speakers, auctions, and socializing. That's some of the stuff that's going on. Let's see what the latest uh, lineup of exhibitors are, if anybody new is here. So we've got myself and Mike Rowan and Richard Lorbieski, Peter Satinsky, Cloud9 is going to be here. Richard Bartlett, Malcolm Ramey, uh, Randy Kindig, Retro Innovations, our friend Jim Brain, Ian Maverick. Uh, I, that was a great interview I listened to with him and um, uh, Randy Kindig of Floppy Days. Uh, Ian Maverick is kind of like the Australian version of our Ed Snyder. He's got uh, a hardware contraption for just about everything. Brendan Donahue's Coco VGA project. Alan, Alan Hightower is going to be showing off five different models of the Tandy 1000 through 5000 series. John Linville is here with his retro tinkering. Hopefully some more maybe um, Game Master sound cartridge stuff to show off. Uh, Evan Wright with his text adventure development kit. Scott Adams from Adventure International. Mike Brandt, my carpool partner, will be there. And Rick Adams showing off Bomb Threat the Game. So that's our current exhibitor lineup looking good. And what about our speaker lineup right now? Oh, see, Rick Adams has been promoted. He's moved up the food chain. <laughs> He's now a keynote speaker. Not just a speaker, but a keynote speaker. No pressure, Rick. <laughs> so along with Scott Adams, Don French, Lance Michaelis, um, some of our keynote Ooh. speakers. Uh, okay, John Linville, keeping Coco in the game. So that'd be interesting to hear what else he's got going on with that. Uh, Peter Satinsky, a history of the Model 2 line, uh, some schmuck here. Uh, Brendan Donahue, uh, talking about e updating extended color basic support 64 column text. And then Randy Kindig of the Floppy Days podcast. Today's portable computers, Tandy's portable computers through the years. Very, very cool. Um, with sponsors from The Right Stuff, Ian Maverick, John Benson. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Is that, is that you, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, when I saw that I had been uh, promoted to a uh, keynote speaker, I thought, oh, rats, that's me not, that means I'm going to be in the, the back row of the plane again. Because <laughs> the, last, the last and only two times I've been a keynote speaker, separated by 30 years, Right. I was, both times, by coincidence, I was in the back row of the plane. But then I thought, oh, wait, I can't be in the back row of the plane. I'm driving. <laughs> so hopefully you'll be at least in the front seat of the car, right? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And by the way, a very nice shirt you're wearing there, Rick. Rick's wearing the official Coco Talk t-shirt. Very cool. Looking good there. Yep. Um, yeah, so Tandy Assembly is coming along. I'm really excited about um, what's going to be happening at this event. And, you know, when we talked about earlier, when we talked about um, the Coleco 
uh, event, which was what not to do, to not only not include the community, but to almost kind of like shun and, and punish the community. That's not a good recipe for success when it comes to having an event and having a, a good turnout to that event, where Tandy Assembly is is combining, you know, the, the TRS-80, Z80 line of people and the, the PC-compatible Tandy 1000 line of people, obviously the coconuts. Um, a lot of different Tandy systems have, have existed for 20 years, from the 70s through the 90s. It's a lot, a lot of lineage there. Uh, and they're doing a good job with a lot of different podcasts promoting it too, between the uh, Floppy Days podcast, the TRS-80 Trash Talkers, and um, the Coco Crew podcast, and now us as well talking about it. So we're definitely trying to expose people, letting people know about this event and getting some people in there. Grant Leedy in the live chat says... Um, yeah, I love that there's a pre-registration. He's asking, how about credit cards for the auctions? That's a great question. I'd pose that question, too, because not everybody carries a lot of cash. And uh, just like, you know, the minute they made fast food and uh, snack machines support debit cards, you know, I mean, look, look, look how those industries just took off, you know. So uh, there's look at Bruce showing off the Forest of Doom, the, the printed manual of Forest of Doom. That looks really good there, uh, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, cool stuff. And so, yeah, if, if you could use your debit card or credit card in the auction, that would be nice, too, because then you might want to spend a little bit more money, especially if you've got a credit card and you're thinking, well, you know, I might not have $400, but I can make easy payments on this. <laughs> <laughs> Seven easy payments to pay off this uh, <laughs> whatever. So uh, hopefully they're thinking about that. So uh Tandy Assembly, our next big event uh, this year. And it's uh, a little over a month away. We're almost at the end of August, and then we got September, and it's the first weekend in October. So it's literally right around the corner. Uh, uh, good stuff, good stuff. We know Rick's going to be there. Uh, Bruce, were you going to be at Tandy Assembly? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Okay. And Mark, do you, re do you remember? I don't remember if you said if you were going to make it or not. Um, I was hoping to, but uh, not so far. Okay, and we know Curtis can't his work yeah, schedule, can. and Nick's not going to be able to make it. Although, Nick, you could probably jump in the suitcase with Ian Maverick or something. He's, he's in Australia. <laughs> he's got to be a way to piggyback off of that uh, transportation there. <laughs> and Australia's got to be small. You guys pay, must be like neighbors or something, right? <laughs> it, it's uphill from down there on the bottom <laughs> of the planet. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a heck, it's a heck of a climb. <laughs> it's a heck of a climb, yeah. Maybe you should ask the OzFest people for assistance. Yeah. Uh, the what? The OzFest? Yeah. What do you mean? Uh, to, to go to the U.S.? Yeah, take up a collection. <laughs> well, back in 1999 and uh, yeah, 2000, that, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, I went to the, uh, did the pen fest in the U.S. Um, yeah. Same way. Yep, yep. We got to crowdsource that uh, that transportation. So that was, was pretty <laughs> PayPal. We had to do that all by hand. Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah. Cool Is stuff. Steve. Yeah, yeah, Rick. Um, so we're hoping to have uh, bomb threat cartridges at uh, at the show. Yeah. That, so that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah. We shall try. Okay, that would be exciting. So is bomb threat pretty much done? Done then at this point. Well, it was, but I got a bright idea last night. Uh, there was <laughs> feature course, creep. You know how that is. Uh -oh. uh, well, no, there's a feature I took out that I couldn't figure out how to put back in. And last night I had a, a brainstorm of, oh, I could, you know, I, I think I know how to do it. So this this weekend's project will be to try to put that uh, uh, feature back in. Okay. Okay. Just don't miss the shipping deadline. Right. So have you, right. the, and, and not and, and not the financial part, but the logistical part of getting these things produced and made, have you already had those conversations and do you feel like you do have enough time to for them to produce the ROMs and the cartridges and the labeling and stuff for you? I believe so. Okay. So that's impressive. So and yeah, you're going to have David so. try it and break it to make sure it's debugged? <laughs> <laughs> if he wants to. Yeah. Well, that'll be exciting because, um, uh, you know, another new cartridge game and the first game from Rick Adams in, gosh, 30 years, right? Right. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, for the collectors out there, 
the question that I was asked was, what I did I want to do shrink wrap on it or not? You know, they have those, uh, you know, the die cut uh, packages, mm-hmm. and they have the uh, those red uh, injection molded uh, cartridge cases. Uh, so they're putting that all together with a little, uh, like a little three by five card instruction manual sort of a thing. And they were asking, you know, should we shrink wrap it or not? And I didn't really, you know, I, I think we can get by without shrink wrapping. It. I just wondered, from a collector's uh, standpoint, what people think. You should do some of both. Do a few because there probably will be people who want to shrink wrap. Is yeah. shrink wrap retro though? Yeah, were they <laughs> ones were shrink wrap? Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so, yeah. That that becomes a collector question. Do you want to have it and have it on a shelf and never play it? And if that is the case, then yeah, shrink wrapping makes sense. But um, if you actually want to play it, play it, right, right, right. And so, do you want to get it autographed? And if you're going to be there and you're going to autographing, and now you can autograph on top of the shrink wrap. But would somebody like it autographed, you know, on the actual box or on the cartridge itself? So. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the number of units are you're going to have made, but maybe have, you know, half and half. So, so if somebody, but if somebody wants to shrink wrap, they'll take it. If somebody doesn't care, they won't. And if somebody says, well, uh, yeah, I'm all out of unshrink wrapped ones, but I don't want to shrink wrap and just tear the damn plastic off, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, and so I was lucky that with, with, with the ones I got from John Linville last year, he sent me one cartridge that wasn't even in the box because I wanted to review Farfall for YouTube and to promote Cocoa Fest. So I got a unboxed copy of Farfall uh, on a cartridge. And then I also asked him if he could sign all the boxes before he shrink wrapped them. So on mine, they're signed and then wrapped. And so I've got three of John's games sitting on a shelf that are autographed and shrink wrapped. And, and I just, it was timing was lucky for me to do it that way. And it just so happens all those games I can play without opening the package. Um, and the same thing with, I bought flood it from Evan Wright and I asked him to autograph the, the, the box and he autographed on top of the shrink wrap he actually emailed me the uh, image where I could play it in an emulator. So I, I, I would like to have an autograph, collectible, and a playable one for myself. But I'm probably, you know, one percent of 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 that. You know, I mean, myself personally, I'm not I'm not a collector per se. I would collect it to play it. So in my case, it doesn't matter if it has shrink wrap because I'd be tearing that right off as soon as I got it anyway. But I'm not a collector collector. Right. So we might do a few. I'm not sure. Oh, we might not do any at all. Um, they're kind of. Is it, is it, it shouldn't be much of an extra cost. I'm presuming it'd be pretty yeah. cheap. Not. It's just a pain. That's all. Ah. Okay. So I remember we used to have the we used to have the shrink wrappers at work, and it was just basically this heated little wires with sheets of plastic. You just place the object, hit it, and it would just automatically shrink once it had sealed, and it didn't. Mm-hmm. You just heated it up, and it was pretty quick. wasn't wasn't too much pain to actually do if you have the equipment. I think they're yeah, going to so, do on the order of. Uh, I think they're okay. going to do on the order of thirty cartridges. Okay, so may, I, think um, that's what they were I would I would say probably on the, just to keep it simple, right? Maybe not do more than ten that are shrink wrapped, and and, yeah. And, yeah. and keep those off to the side. And if somebody wants a sealed copy, you have that. And for anybody else that wants right. it to play it and get it autographed, because I'm, I would imagine. I know for me, I would like an autographed copy. I'll probably buy one of each because I'm I'm that guy. Um, but yeah, I'd probably like an autograph copy. I want an autograph on the box, an autograph on the cartridge, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then how a seal. About, uh, hey, listen, how about uh, putting a bunch of cartridges in the landfill for a while? Here's <laughs> <laughs> an idea: um, shrink wrap the box without the cartridge in it. That way, you sell it separate. If they want to keep the shrink wrap copy uh, for their collection on display, they've got the shrink wrap version, but they've still got the cartridge outside to play. Oh, brother. <laughs> we'll be seeing those for years on eBay then. <laughs> yeah, but then it's not quite retro enough, Nick, because then it doesn't weigh the same because there's no cartridge in it. Yes. Stick a lead sinker inside it. Can any of you see the Atari uh, movie? Yes. Yeah. So, so I, I didn't see it, but somebody was mentioning that to me. Yeah. yeah. Atari Game Over, I believe, was the name. Right, 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 right. right. 
Cool stuff. Yeah, I guess, you know, that's that's a tough call. And what you're doing is you're introducing more work for the people who are producing it and then possibly more expense to yourself. So I would say probably you want to minimize those for everybody's sake. Yeah. And keep, keep everybody's so life probably, yeah, five, five or ten maybe. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see. I would say there'll be people who'll be interested. I mean, Steve, also, obviously, but there'll probably be some yeah. other people too. Right. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. All right. So for those of you who are watching us live right now, and we've had we've had a decent um, viewership all day. We've been up to uh, a dozen and a half, two dozen live viewers. We're, up, we're at a dozen right now. Um, hopefully everybody's aware that Coco Talk is now also available in podcast format. So you can listen to us online and uh, put, a, put together a website for that. It's CocoTalk.live. Uh, as of today, I have 10 episodes already converted to audio, and I've got three of our interviews, um, one of them being Rick Adams, uh, another one is Curtis Boyle, and then we also have the Dale Lear interview up there. And I have uh, we've got a lot of interviews, and I think one of the next ones I want to put up there is the one with the image producers because there's a lot of great stuff covered there. And most of that translates very well to audio format because even though we were showing some things off, none of the conversations had to do with what was actually on screen for the most part. So I think that'll be a good, a good listen. And um, for me, it was fun listening to the Rick interview. Rick was our first scheduled interview. Like Curtis and I, Curtis was my first interview. It was very informal. Rick, we scheduled and we planned and we had a list of questions and we promoted it and it was live and everything else. And so Rick was our first big celebrity interview. Uh, and, you know, even though technically I was there, I was distracted by playing the game and, and watching the live chat. So to actually sit down and listen to that interview again was kind of nice. You know, um, so I, I think it's kind of cool that these things get a whole second life in the audio aftermarket. And um, I think the response has been pretty good. There are a lot of people saying, I really appreciate being able to listen to this because it's easier for my workflow of how I drive and commute and things like that. So um, I, I think it's uh, the uh, podcast has turned out to be pretty good. We got close to 400 downloads already, which is pretty good. If that's an indication. So um, cool, cool stuff. Coco Talk will be um, consumable in many ways. I'm actually looking into a few other um, ways to do it as well, which we'll, we'll share later on. Uh, cool stuff. Anything else we want to talk about? Right, we beat this episode to death. I can't think of anything else in my my behalf. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Bruce is doing his stuff there, his voiceover. Hey, uh, Bruce, actually, uh, I don't know. Bruce, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, is that the video you're showing there of um, of you doing the voiceover for Forest of Doom? Yeah, yeah. Do we want to play that? There. I'm. Uh, let me see if I can un if I can get the audio to come through. Okay. Wow, you've got a big giant foam block around that microphone there too. You look extremely professional, sir. All the good tricks. Yeah. Yep. A spit guard. <laughs> the only thing missing is the tinfoil hat at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still there? And uh, now I, I can't muted. hear you. You there, muted. My, there's my audio. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was just my little voiceover setup. I didn't actually use a spit guard. I just kept the microphone below. And then, uh, yeah, that foam box is my homemade uh, muffler, basically, for any reflections from the back. So, okay. Uh, That's pretty cool. Yeah. Fun stuff. Fun stuff. But we didn't hear it, though. Yeah, yeah it was too quiet. Um, yeah, I've got another um, probably um, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe two weeks from now, I'll have another bit that's very podcast friendly that I'll, I'll have available for, uh, okay. for you. That works. Cool. That works. Yeah. Very, very cool. All right. Well, maybe we're going to wrap up episode 22 of Coco Talk Live. And for those of us who are still left on the call, I want to thank Rick Adams for stopping in and Mark Overholzer, Ron Delvaux for sharing some of his cool collections and his little demonstration of that digitizer. Nick yeah. Morentes, uh, also for sharing uh, Pac-Man 1.1, free to the public release there. Very cool. 
Curtis Boyle, host of the Color Computer Games List website, and Bruce Moore, author of Forest of Doom and many other fun games available and from T&D Software and a Cocoa retailer near you. And in the live chat, the first person we had in the live chat today was Steve Powell, who was actually 40 minutes early to the show. Richard Cavell was in the live chat today. Sixy, who is Karen, was in the live chat. Home Computer Museum was in here. John Linville, Cocoa Crew Podcast, was joining us today. Norlander was here. Uh, Solstice was here. Ficecap was here. Luis Fernandez was in the chat. Um, Grant Leedy in the chat. Grant had to work today, could not join us. So we'll have Grant's hopefully next week newbie question of the week next week. Uh, am I missing anybody else in the live chat that I did not already mention? Somebody named Crumbopolis Michael uh, was commenting on uh, my Need More Cowbell video. Norlander was commenting as well. Um, have I missed anybody else? No, I think so. I think we've covered everybody in the live chat and everybody on the call. Um, with us earlier was David Ladd with his tech segment of what David has discovered is broken this week. So, <laughs> uh, Another great Coco Talk. And so what I also want to do is I want to close with some Coco music since uh, it'll be hopefully a fun treat for those watching and for those listening later. Trying to include a few more audio segments in the show to make the show a little bit more podcast friendly as well. So uh, everybody want to say goodbye. Anything you want to say before we switch to our closing music track? Nothing Bye. extra to say, but we'll see all you next All right. Week. Very cool. Thank you all for being here. Don't forget to check us out on the web at cocotalk.live. And me. to play us out, we're going to hear some Coco music now, folks. <laughs> Thank you.